34, Old Testament mercy and grace. We truly thank God for the multitude of resources available to those with a desire to study the scripture. Prior to the introduction of study helps like concordances and books like the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge, people study the Bible by primarily reading it. Preachers have benefited greatly from the time saving offered by these resources, especially when you add in Bible study software. However, these tools have also helped to cultivate a certain lazy recklessness in Bible study. This lazy Bible study has produced some unintended outcomes and contributed to an ignorant, shallow Christianity. We become so reliant on the tools that we lose the benefits derived from simply reading through the Scripture. We become convinced that when a specific word is not used in a passage, it must not be the passage's focus. Additionally, we sometimes forget that words take on various forms or we ignore the use of synonyms. This shallow study has certainly been detrimental to sound Bible study. For example, a study of grace in the Bible offers a case in point. The word grace occurs 170 times in 159 verses, 39 times in 37 Old Testament verses, and 131 times in 122 New Testament verses. Focusing solely upon word usage, some people have unwisely concluded that the Old Testament God was much less gracious than the New Testament God. Yet, for a more complete understanding of grace, one must also study words like gracious, occurring 31 times in 30 verses, of which only two references are found in the New Testament, and graciously, occurring four times in four verses, all found in the Old Testament. Using the same logic, one would conclude that God was more gracious in the Old Testament. The actual truth becomes even clearer when the student considers the various synonyms of grace found throughout the Bible. Furthermore, the statistics above do not and cannot account for other passages clearly declaring the grace of God, but without using the word grace. Therefore, it is crucial to understand that grace is free, unmerited love and favor, and that gracious infers being disposed to forgive offenses and impart unmerited blessings. To prove the inadequacy of assuming that a particular truth is only taught when a specific word is used, consider the following passage. This passage, among many, demonstrates that grace can clearly be found in the Old Testament without using any form of the word itself. Deuteronomy 7.7 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. This passage depicts God's unmerited love, grace, upon an undeserving nation. Some teachers point to the fewer uses of the word grace in the Old Testament and assume grace was minimized therein. Yet the greatest word demonstrating God's grace in the previous passage is the word love. In other words, to fully study grace in the Bible, one would also need to study the word love, which appears 131 times in 124 Old Testament verses. True Bible study would also recognize that one would need to study all the references to favor, which is found 70 times in 70 verses with 64 occurring in the Old Testament. Hopefully you see the dangers of lazy, reckless Bible study. Another important truth to grasp concerns how grace and mercy are frequently mentioned together. Mercy, that is mercy, mercies, mercies with an apostrophe, and merciful occurs throughout the Bible. 294 times in 274 Old Testament verses and 70 times in 62 New Testament verses. With these statistics, some have concluded that God was more merciful in the Old Testament with a change in emphasis to grace in the New Testament. Unfortunately, this conclusion is at best careless and shallow Bible study. In fact, if this conclusion was not so preposterous, short-sighted, and detrimental to both the Lord's character and his dealings with man, it would simply be dismissed as a pathetic attempt to force God into a box. The Companions of Mercy and Grace Nineteen Bible verses contain a combination of the words grace, grace or gracious, and mercy, mercy, mercies, mercies with the apostrophe or merciful. Fourteen of those are found in the Old Testament. Consider the following verses containing both. Genesis 19:19. 19, 19. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Exodus 33:19. And he said, 
I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Exodus 34, 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. Second Chronicles 30, verse 9. For if ye turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and will not turn away his face from you if ye return unto him. Nehemiah 9:17 and refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of a great kindness, and forsookest them not. Nehemiah 9.31 Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. Psalm 77, 9. God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. Psalm 86, 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion, and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Psalm 116, verse 5. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. Psalm 145, verse 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Isaiah 30, verse 18. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you, for the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Joel 2, 13. And rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of a great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Jonah 4, 2. And he prayed unto the Lord, and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying, when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. 1 Timothy 1, 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Timothy 1, 2. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Titus 1, 4. To Titus, my own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 2 John 3, Grace be with you, mercy and peace, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. No doubt God intended for there to exist a strong connection between mercy and grace. In fact, the list above excludes passages where the words are included in the proximity of each other, but not found within the same verse. The next passage shows how closely mercy and grace are associated. Ezra 9, 8. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. Not only does this passage include both the words grace and mercy, but also indicates the distinctions between the two. God showed grace in leaving a remnant, giving a nail in his holy place, and enlightening the eyes. He extended mercy in not forsaking the people in their bondage. In God's grace, he gave Israel unmerited favor, and in his mercy, he withheld deserved consequences. Along these lines, it is quite eye-opening to consider the recipients of the combination of grace and mercy, those who had forsaken the commandments and committed evil deeds. These unmerited graces were extended to an undeserving people because they are the ones that need grace. Ezra 9.10 And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. Verse 13. And after all that is come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve. 
that's mercy, and hast given us such deliverance as this, that's grace. All sinners in both Old and New Testaments need God's mercy and His grace. Those in Ezra's day were not unique in the Old Testament to experience God's mercy and grace. In fact, after David was confronted by Nathan, he knew his adulterous affair with Bathsheba and the killing of Uriah left him without any hope apart from the mercy and grace of God. Once David admitted his sin, Nathan told David of God's mercy and grace, both undeserved and unmerited. Second Samuel 12, verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Grace, thou shalt not die. Mercy. Grace and mercy are found throughout the Bible. Overemphasizing one element while minimizing another not only creates and promotes fringe doctrines, but also contradicts the clear teachings of Scripture. For example, Noah was warned of God of things not seen as yet, Hebrews 11.7. Noah believed the word and was moved with fear to act upon that word, Hebrews 11.7. The book of Genesis describes that event as Noah finding grace in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6.8. And the outcome was that he became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith, Hebrews 11, 7. According to 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, the preparation of the ark was the answer of a good conscience toward God, not a soul-saving work of man. Each of these passages is crucial for the full understanding of God's dealings with Noah. Noah was made righteous by faith in God's word and the gift of God's grace. The answer of a good conscience was to prepare the ark. Denying that this same principle applies throughout the scripture is to deny God. Unfortunately, some have neglected elements of the truth to teach that Old Testament saints were not saved by grace, but simply safe due to the mercy of God in response to their keeping of God's commandments. False teachings generally become popular heresies when left unchecked. This false teaching originates from verses like the following. Exodus 20, verse 6, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. A careless reading of this passage might lead a beginning Bible student to believe that Old Testament saints earn mercy by faithful obedience to the commandments of God. How can anyone merit something unmerited through works? This type of private interpretation happens when the teacher overlooks both the cause of the obedience and the God-intended order presented in the passage, love over obedience. With this understanding, one can deduce that love is the cause and obedience is the effect. This is the pattern of each example in Hebrews chapter 11, save one. Faith is the cause and obedience is the effect. If this pattern of love preceding mercy and producing obedience holds true, we should find it throughout the Old Testament and we do. Deuteronomy 5.10, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Deuteronomy 7.9, know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. 1 Kings 8.23, and he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath who keepeth covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. Second Chronicles 6.14, And said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven nor in the earth, which keepest covenant and showest mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. Nehemiah 1.5, And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Daniel 9.4, and I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Obviously, there is always a connection between love, obedience, and mercy. But what kind of connection? Both John's gospel and his epistles offer clarity concerning the matter. One keeps the commandments of God as a result of the love that he has for God. John fourteen fifteen. If ye love me, keep my commandments. John fourteen twenty one. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. First John five two. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. The love of God or love toward Him is defined by what we do, how we live. When we obey God, we display our love for God. The character of God. 
Some may wonder why it is so very important to prove that God was gracious in the Old Testament. To grasp the importance of this issue, consider the following points. True dispensationalists have rightly made a distinction between God's person or character and his work or his dealings with man. This distinction is crucial to maintain scriptural integrity and understanding. This is true because God's dealings with man change from age to age, yet his character must remain the same throughout time and eternity. Simply put, his character never changes. He said as much, Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God's works are simply an outpouring of his character. He does what he does because of who he is. In other words, God loves because he is love. He extends mercy because he is merciful. He extends grace because he is gracious. This is crucial to understand. To deny God's grace at any point in time is to deny God's character. To minimize God's grace in the Old Testament is to minimize his character. Denying or minimizing any aspect of God's character is inexcusably wicked. The reality is that God is, has been, and will always be gracious. In fact, God's graciousness was so much a part of his character that it was identified as part of his name. This truth is clearly taught in the end of Exodus chapter 33 and the beginning of chapter 34. Toward the end of Exodus chapter 33, Moses requests to see God's glory, Exodus 33:18. In response, God promised not only to show Moses his glory, but also to proclaim his name. According to God, his name is his character, and that name includes him being gracious, Exodus 34:5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, under the third and to the fourth generation. How could anyone deny the outpouring of God's grace from the gracious God in the Old Testament? Prior to Christ's blood sacrifice, God instituted a stopgap measure. This was necessary because God could not merely clear a man's record of sin. The man could be forgiven, but not cleared. His sin and iniquity overlooked, but not removed. Moses certainly understood these truths. Springing forth from God's character, Moses found grace from a gracious God. Then he asked God to pardon the iniquity and sin of an undeserving people, taking these people for his inheritance. Exodus 34, 9. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. The character of God became a theme among God's people. First, God identified himself as gracious, Exodus 22:27, and soon his messengers followed his lead by making the same proclamation. While it is obvious that these messengers saw God as just and righteous and holy, to name a few, they also repeatedly set forth God as one who is gracious, Exodus 34:6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Second Chronicles 30, verse 9. For if ye turn again unto the Lord your brethren, your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if ye return unto him. Nehemiah 9:17 and refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of a great kindness, and forsookest them not. Nehemiah 9.31 Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. Psalm 86.15, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalm 103, verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Psalm 111, verse 4, 
He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Psalm 112, verse 4. Under the upright there ariseth the light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Psalm 116, verse 4. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Psalm 145, verse 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Joel 2.13. And rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of a great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Jonah 4.2. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. While each of these passages offers tremendous insight into the grace of God and its extension to man, consider for a moment the peculiarity of Nehemiah's proclamation below. According to Nehemiah 9.17, God was a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful. Surely the context proves that God was gracious and ready to pardon those who had not faithfully kept his commandments. To whom was God ready to pardon and extend grace and mercy? Nehemiah 9.16 But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments and refused to obey and neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them but hardened their necks and in their rebellion appointed a captain returned to their bondage but thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of a great kindness and forsookest them not. The very extension of grace to those in the Old Testament declares its necessity during that time. The children of Israel dealt proudly, hardened their necks, refused to listen to and obey God, forgot God's wonders, and in their rebellion sought to return to Egypt. But God, despite all this rebellion and hard-heartedness, God remained ready to pardon because he is a gracious and merciful God. Yet some preachers minimize God. Only a Bible novice would look back to the Old Testament and suggest a famine or dearth of God's grace. How dare we look upon those saints who lived in years gone by and suggest that they somehow earned God's favor. To do so is analogous to the hardship of expecting saved Gentiles to act like unsaved Jews, of which Peter said, Why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Acts 15.10 It is ludicrous to think for a moment that Old Testament saints who had such a stringent law and no permanent indwelling Savior, Holy Ghost, could keep that which we who are saved cannot keep despite our being indwelled by the Savior and the Holy Ghost, the need and desire of man. It should come as no surprise that people who lived in the Old Testament times were far less equipped than Christians indwelled with the Spirit today. One would think every Bible student would recognize the need for God's grace prior to Christ's sacrifice. In fact, the pleas from the Old Testament saints revealed that God's grace was a high priority for God's people. They beseeched God for it. Isaiah 33, 2. O Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. Malachi 1, 9. And now I pray you, beseech God, that he will be gracious unto you. This hath been by your means, will he regard your persons, saith the Lord of hosts. While from a different perspective, the life of Jonah also expressed this need and opportunity for God's grace. Jonah did not want to preach in Nineveh because he knew that if Nineveh repented, God would not destroy them. As Jonah feared, the people of Nineveh responded favorably to Jonah's preaching and God mercifully and graciously turned away his wrath. But why? Jonah 4.1 But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of a great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Why would Jonah have expected God's grace to be extended to the Ninevites unless he too was familiar with God's grace? Yet there are some who live today 
who questioned God's grace in the Old Testament. According to the scripture, God's grace was both a desire of God's people and a fear for rebellious, selfish prophet. Let us not be guilty of joining the ranks of those who question the character and faithfulness of God. Let us rise above the rantings of men looking to be lauded for their new doctrines, which are simply regurgitated untruths. Psalm 77, 7. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. Thankfully, only God's grace and mercy would stop him from expressing his disgust toward those who call his character into question. We pray that each of us will learn that although God is gracious and merciful and long-suffering, there is no reason to presume upon his gracious character. Any diminishing of God's character insults the God of the universe. God forbid. This is the end of chapter 34.